Thank you, Michelle. Good morning. My name is Brian Farrell. I'm helping out in worship this morning. Welcome to Nielsville. Welcome to our worship service. And welcome to Advent. It's great to be here with you. It's Advent. It's a season of preparation for Christmas for the birth of our Lord. That means it's Advent devotional time. You can find this purple devotional out on the table in the back, or you can find it online. You can participate in the class we're having on Sunday mornings. You can do it on your own at home. It's, it'll, be, it'll be very helpful. I, I would encourage you to do that. If any of you are worshiping with us for the first time today, you'll find a green card in the hymn rack, in the pew rack in front of you. If you could fill that out and uh, give it to one of the welcome team, we'd have a gift for you. We'd love to welcome you. I should also note that there are these yellow cards up there prayer cards. We are a praying church. We like to pray. We'd like to pray for you or with you for your joys or your concerns. So hand that in and we will be praying. And I should note that next Sunday is our normal once a month after church special prayer time. So I put that on your calendar. Come after church, 15-20 minutes of, of time to pray for the concerns of the church. That would be a great thing to do. There's a lot of other announcements in the bulletin. I'm just going to really highlight them really quickly. There's one that's not in the bulletin. Uh, Kathy Yurovsky has a boatload of Christmas lights out in the back there, and she'd like to give them away. So if you need Christmas lights, talk to her after the service. There's also some uh, crocheted Christmas ornaments on the table out there, which apparently are free. So keep your eyes open for those things. Uh, highlighting just a few of these announcements in the bulletin, the Women's Ministry is having an event next Saturday evening candle making, dessert singing. It should be a good time. Um, you can find the details in the bulletin. There's a, a red card available. If it's not in the pew rack, you can find it on a table out in the narthex. Uh, it's available to order a poinsettia. You can order it. It will be here to decorate our uh, sanctuary for Christmas, and then you can take it home thereafter. Uh, one other thing I'll mention is this uh, announcement about encouragement for a local law enforcement officer, this terrible accident, and this guy was very badly hurt. And we can support him and encourage him. So we have some connections and can get information to him. Read that, read about that in your bulletin and, and find out how we can do that. Let me call up Michelle Nelson, who will tell us about the Giving Tree. It's, it's a great way to participate in the season, to bless others, and to feel good about it. And Michelle does a great job running it. So Michelle.
Good morning, everybody. Um, our giving tree is up in the narthex. This is a really special program that Nielsva has been doing for a very long time. Um, this is my seventh year coordinating it, and it's always a really special thing for me and for my family to do. Um, this year, we have 12 families. We receive those families' information from Germantown Help, and they specifically handpick families that need a little bit of extra love and attention during the holidays, um, because Nielsville has always shown them that. Um, we have some particularly hard families this year in, in hard situations. We have one with foster kids. We have one woman who's raising her five grandkids. We have a mom that's currently in the hospital right now just recovering from brain surgery. Um, she doesn't know if she's going to be home for Christmas. Um, part of the program is we, we provide two gifts per child. We also provide them food so they can make a Christmas meal. She doesn't know if she's going to be able to stand on her feet and cook Christmas. So a special request would be maybe someone or a group of people would like to send that family a prepared meal. Um, there are some other special needs this year that aren't on the tree. Um, if you're interested in helping, come talk to me. We can, we can brainstorm things that we might be able to do for those families. Um, a lot of the gift requests this year were for clothes. Seven kids need winter coats. Um, that, I always want to make sure that gets taken care of. I want to make sure these kids are nice and warm during the winter season. But there, there are toys, there are other things just to make them happy, you know, this year. If you don't like shopping but you want to help in some way, come talk to me. I'm very happy to, to help do that. Um, as I talk to these families, I'm always on the lookout for deals or, or trying to understand what the certain toy is this year that my kids, you know, might have outgrown. Um, so how, how do you get involved? So out on the tree, you'll see these tags. Um, blue ones are for gifts. Pink ones are for baked goods that you can either make or buy for the family that'll go with their Christmas meal. We have six of our families on the tree. We have the other six on a sign up genius that's online. So there's a QR code in your bulletin and there's an, a link in the e-letter. Two different lists. We don't repeat the families on, this, on those lists. Um, so if you're doing the tree, you take this little tag on the white portion, write your name and a contact information. If something changes or if you happen to misplace the tag, um, I can tell you what you signed up for. Just rip this white part off and drop it on the jar that's on the table by the tree. If you're doing it online, there's um, instructions in the Sign Up Genius. There's some of these out on the table as well. You can um, drop the, the gifts off here. You can ship them to my house, you know, whatever is easiest for you. Um, if you're doing it online, there's a, a blank tag, or you can even just write a piece of paper with the family name, the child's name, or family number, child's name, and gift number on, the on any piece of paper, slap it on the present, and I'll make sure it gets to them. Um, so when you, when you wrap your gifts and you bring them back to church, there will be boxes, 12 boxes out there with family numbers. You just match your gift to the family number, put it in the box, and we'll get everything ready. Um, everything is due by Tuesday, December 19th. Um, again, make sure your gift has the tag on it. Um, and then most importantly, pray for these families, not just now, but throughout the year, um, for their finances, for their health for that they're growing closer to God um, throughout the year and as part of this. Um, it's not just the gifts that we give them. We give them Bibles, we give them a nativity, um, and our team keeps in touch with them throughout the year to invite them to Easter, to vacation Bible school, to tr trunk or treat, just to show them that we are here for them. Um, we want to show them God's love and support them throughout the year. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank you very much, Michelle. You are known, you are known as a praying church. Pray for these families. And you are known as a generous church. Craig Errol can tell you about that. They, rebuilding Montgomery gives us the hardest house they can invent so that we'll have extra project to work. And Michelle said these, the, the Giving Tree people have assigned us special needs, special uh, families that need extra care. They know that you are a giving church. So it, it, consider that. Talk to Michelle, it's always well organized and you can figure out how to best do that. So, having taken care of the major announcements for the day, I would ask Kathy and Kim to come forward as we begin our worship and they'll help us with the Advent. Please rise for our call to worship. Come, 
world of darkness. And across world of light. We come from a world of weariness into God's strength and hope. We come from a slumbering world. Strengthened by the Spirit, we come to awaken our souls and watch for the coming of Christ. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Um, as others have said, we are thrilled that you're here today to worship the Lord with us. And uh, we welcome both those here in the sanctuary as well as people online. Today, we begin the season of Advent, a time in which we prepare ourselves to celebrate again God's gift of himself to us in the child of Bethlehem. Advent is also an opportunity to renew our faith in the Lord's promise to come again to complete the work of the world's redemption begun in him. Hear the words of the Apostle Paul from Ephesians 1, 18 and 19. We pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Please join us in prayer now. Lord Jesus, the scriptures remind us that you are the hope of the world and that you are the light of the world. As we begin our worship this morning, we begin by confessing to you the hopelessness and despair that is within us and in our world. Left to ourselves, we are fearful and lost. We turn away from you and hide in the shadows of our sinfulness. But you have sent your Son, giving us light and hope for new life. We pray that you would examine our hearts as we confess our sins before you in silence. Please take a moment. Hear our prayers, O Lord, for we lift them to you in the strong and mighty name of Jesus, the hope of the world. We light this candle as a symbol of the light of hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. In his name is the hope and assurance of our forgiveness and new life. Thanks be to God. In closing, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Please stand now and let us worship God as we sing his praises. Thank you.
We come this morning to behold you. Behold the one who has shown us grace, who has shown us redemption, has shown us salvation, has shown us what it looks like to be renewed, to restored. Lord, we come praising our triune God, Father, Holy Spirit, this Advent season as we remember the hope that you bring, the love that you bring, the joy that you bring, and the peace that you bring through your Son, your only, one and only Son, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, in his ascension, in his intercession. Or we come confidently knowing that one day you will come again. And we look forward to that day. So we, we come confidently, we come expectantly, come Lord Jesus. But as we, as we wait on your coming, Lord, we pray that our lives would be filled with praises unto you, that our lives would show forth out of thanksgiving for the great grace that we've been given in Christ. So this, this Advent season, as we, as we think about the hope that you bring, may that then encourage us, no matter what we may be experiencing today and tomorrow or in the future, we know that we have a 100% guarantee, Lord Jesus, that you will bring us to our final destination. So we come and thank you and we worship you because we have a hope that, is a, that we can be confident, that is guaranteed, and we give you all the praise and glory for that certainty. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before there was light, walked across the pages of time. He who made every living thing, 
Amen. Please be seated. Well, that was beautiful. Thank you, musicians. That's good advice, too. Behold him. We're thankful that we have wonderful volunteer musicians who help us worship. Uh, they are giving generously and cheerfully. And now's your chance. You are known as a generous church. Give generously, cheerfully, proportionally to support others. But we need to support our work here as well. And we need to support the many, many ministries that we support. So I would encourage you to do that. And we will let our overworked musicians have another opportunity to play an offertory. Father, we thank you that you have given us many opportunities to serve you. We thank you that we have opportunities here in our own building, in our own community, in our county, around the world. We pray, Lord, that you will encourage us to do that. We pray, Lord, that you will take these gifts that we give and multiply them and use them to greatly accomplish the work you would have us to accomplish. And we ask this through your Son, who is our Lord Jesus. Amen. You may please be seated. If you have children in ages three through second grade who've registered for the worship and play zone, let me offer a blessing. Dear Lord, we lift up these children. We thank you that they're here. We thank you for their energy, for their life, for their vigor, for their curiosity. We pray, Lord, that you will bless them, that you will encourage them, that the worship and play zone 
will be a meaningful time of growth for them, that, the, that through this opportunity and others, that they will draw nearer to you and become more like you as they mature. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the children are dismissed. church. Welcome to our Advent season. Uh, thank you, Brian, for your uh, leading us this morning and for your just sharing appreciation. That really touched my heart, just how you, you acknowledge each of our worship teams, and I appreciate uh, and just our efforts, and it's good to remind, remind us of um, God's faithfulness to us and our response to that. So I'm thankful for you as well as a church and the love that you bring um, to our community and to one another. Well, the next few weeks, we'll be focusing on the messages of Christmas. We'll look at how Jesus brings hope, Jesus brings love, Jesus brings joy, and Jesus brings peace into this very world that seems broken. It is broken and seems that it's in chaos at times, and it's very messy, as we know. I will also be bringing some of the material in the devotional that we are having you to look at. The Christianity Today, uh, the internal king arrives. So if you want to, I would encourage you to pick up a copy of one of those in the Northex. There's also a PDF form, and I believe you can get that link in our bullets in our, in our in the newsletter. Is that correct, Michelle? Yeah, that is correct. People are nodding. So just so you know, we're going to be looking at that, and on Sundays we'll be bringing some of the those um, nuggets that I that I that I have appreciated as I have been reading the devotional. As you will see, we are focusing on hope. As you have read, as you have in our liturgy today, it has mostly been the theme of hope. We have hope for many things in our world. During this holiday season, we have hope of what Santa will bring us. Uh, I had hope that if I did the 12 hour of prayer Virgil that my body would recover okay well that hope was not so much delivered <laughs> I'm glad I'm here today I went to bed very early yesterday, last yesterday. Um, we have hope that we would be finally feeling well after a long year maybe of illness we hope for a new job or a new car or a new house we hope that our interest rates would go down and that prices would go down uh, we have hope um, for that white college for us to, for one maybe wanting to go to. I believe that we're designed to have hope. God wants us to have hope. But my dear friends, none of the things that I mentioned are promised or guaranteed to us. So what is the hope that we're to have? What is the hope that we can bank on? What is the hope that can be promised and it's 100% guaranteed to be fulfilled? Well, one of the passages we're going to look at is a passage I'm about to read, Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. And here we begin our journey this Advent season. And as what has been prayed or encouraged already, that during this Advent season, that we would be renewed in our faith, strengthened in our faith, that we would have a deeper hope in God through Christ. So follow along as I read Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Let's pray. Gracious God, even before as we gather around your word, I do just want to just pray for um, some, some people in our congregation, some who have been experiencing 
illnesses, some even, as we know, are dealing with COVID. And we pray for your grace and mercy, that your healing grace will be upon, upon them. You know who they are. And so, Lord, we ask for their benefit. We know that some are recovering from surgery. We think of Shirley, and we pray, Father, continue for her, that you would strengthen her, that you would continue to help her to grow stronger each day. We know that others have had surgery, our upcoming surgery. We pray for those upcoming surgeries that, doctor, that you would be with the doctors, that you would guide their hands as they, as they, as they do their work uh, for the sake of the one uh, two who are here in our congregation that are having surgery in the upcoming weeks and weeks ahead. May your mercy be upon them. Give them hope to know that you are with them even during that time. Lord, we pray for William, our missionary in Ghana. And Lord, it's been a hard year for them. And, and Lord, we pray that they would hold on to your hope, Lord Jesus, that you are with them and for them, and that you're wanting and delighting to work in and through their ministry there in Ghana. We pray that they would look to you, Lord Jesus, as their hope. Lord, give them the money and the finances that they need to continue that work, where you raise up people to help them to finish building their church. Or may most of all, Lord, we know that they have a heart to reach people with Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give them divine opportunities and appointments that people would, that they would be directed to people that need to hear the gospel. Bless their ministry, we pray. And now, Father, as we gather around your word this morning, as we, as we consider the hope that we're to have, Lord, that, that we would be greatly encouraged by that, that no matter what we face in life, we know that we have a Savior who is with us and for us and will be coming back to bring us home to spend eternity with you forever. Lord, we look forward to that. And so, Lord, bless our time now in Jesus' name. Amen. I feel so far from you. Um, I'd like to be closer. Maybe next time, I'll, if you put me on the stage a little bit. I don't, I don't want to be so far. Um, uh, Val and I were, uh, were in California for our wedding many years ago, and I received an urgent phone call. And on the other line of the phone was a woman who was desperate, was heavy-hearted, was dealing with depression, suicidal thoughts. And as she hurriedly and excitedly began to share her story, I was actively listening to her. I was also thinking the Holy Spirit, Lord, Spirit, give me wisdom, discernment to know how best to care for this woman who is in a desperate situation. She felt life was so hard, so painful. How, will she, how was she going to survive? And as I was actively thinking through how best to care for her, I was asking, what does she need? Holy Spirit, give me the words that she needs, the hope that she needs. What will help her to know that she can survive what she's going through? that day. She needed to hear and receive the message of hope. Some of us here today are in a season of fear or in anxiety or in turmoil due to poor health, inadequate funds, relational conflict with family, friends, or others. You yourself are just, you feel hopeless about the failures that you continue to do day in and day out. You're disappointed in how life has turned out for you and you're feeling hopeless that any of these situations will ever change. Many of us are witnessing uh, from our very eyes wars and conflicts and injustices, greed, tyranny, and hate expressed all over our nation and in the world. And we wonder, is this going to be the status quo for the world? And so we lack any hope that anything can change or that even God cares or is he present? Well, this Advent season, I want us to remind her that our eternal king has arrived, and he's coming back to bring us to our final destination. And because of that, we can have confident hope in the midst of these challenging days ahead. I want to first set, set, read to you this poem, The Night of Nights, and help us to get in, a, in that proper mood of what this Advent season reminds us of. Listen, follow along, read along, whatever works best for you. Close your eyes if that's helpful. But listen to this beautiful poem about the night of nights. So many moons had come and gone across the heaven fair. Day followed night, night followed day, in usual sequence there. 
But one night in the velvet sky, a brilliant star appeared, a strange phenomenon indeed, all who saw it feared. Shepherds upon a lonely hill stood dumbstruck and afraid. Some left their shepherd in panic, their sheep in panic, while still others knelt and prayed. Just then bright angels pierced the night with widespread rings across the sky, singing a song of peace on earth, glory to God on high. Meanwhile, the lofty star had burned a pathway through the night. The humble inn of Bethlehem was flooded with its light. That this night, a night of miracles, differed from all the rest, for Christ was born to Mary, all the weary wood world to bless. Let us go, the shepherds cried, to see this holy sight. Oh, and on to Bethlehem they went, on, on into the night. And there they beheld the infant king and worshiped and adored the one who God had sent to be the Savior, Christ the Lord. This night, so mystical, so sweet, differed from all the other. Because a Savior came, there's hope for every man and his brother. Ever since the fall into sin of Adam and Eve, our first parents, that brought sin and decay in the world, God has promised to send a redeemer and a deliverer to restore and renew all of creation. From Genesis 3, throughout all the, to the Old Testament, through the prophets, he had a promise, a Messiah that was going to come, that was etched in stone. And we see this in the following two prophecies from Micah and Isaiah. Now, there's many others that prophesy about the promised Messiah, but I want to focus first on Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5, and then Isaiah 7, 10 to 14. Listen to Micah 5, verses 2 through 5. Here we see our humble, kingly shepherd has arrived. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephraim, you who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when he who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of the, his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure, for, he, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. He shall be their peace. Look what he says, Micah says, about the promised Messiah. It says that he will be born in Bethlehem, that he will rule over Israel, and that he will shepherd his flock. And as a result, God's people will dwell secure and have lasting hope and peace. See, God's people during that time were not faithful in living out their faith. Sin was running rampant. Injustices were experienced by many. And yet God, in the midst of that, through Micah, promises a shepherd king who in covenant faithfulness gathers, protects, and forgives them. This proclamation in Micah 5 is both bold and clear that God's designed new of news of the birth of the shepherd king is not kept in secret, but to spread throughout the land with confidence. This good news was to instill in God's people even amid their rebellion. God wanted to remind them that he was, has not forgotten them. In fact, that he delights to restore them and provide messianic hope as they live in a broken, hostile world. You do wonder what God's people felt during this time as they awaited the promised Messiah. As they heard again and again that a Messiah was going to come, how then did they live? How did it affect them? Were they curious? Did they dream about that day? Did it give them hope? Or did they ignore it 
Did they dismiss it? Did they ask questions like, what will this king be like? How will he shepherd us? How will this king make himself known when he finally did come? My friends, we see the answer in Jesus. We see that Jesus came humbly as a baby born in Bethlehem, just as that prophecy predicted. And people like the shepherds and later the magi recognized him as the savior and as the king. Jesus showed us, in his, even in his adult life, that he's a faithful shepherd who provided strength and safety for his people. His presence provided real peace and confident hope. You see, it is only Jesus who brings true and confident hope, for he alone has secured our place in his kingdom and has provided the peace we desperately needed to be made right with God. Truly, there is no safer, no secure, no, nothing more secure than to be in Jesus Christ. So think about that, that thing that you might be wrestling, that situation that's been difficult, or that thing that you're really hoping for that you think will bring meaning and purpose. None is safer, none is more secure than the promise of our Savior who came and will be coming again. We have a humble Savior a humble king who will shepherd us. But we also see in the Isaiah passage that we have a redeemer who is relentlessly our Emmanuel. He has arrived. Our relentless Emmanuel arrives. Look at Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 14. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as soul or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, hear then, O house of David, it is too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, as we think about this particular prophecy at this particular time in history, it's important to know about King Ahaz. Ahaz at that point was afraid of the impending political danger and strife that was coming to him and to the nation of Judah. Enemies were closing into, onto Ahaz in the kingdom. And Ahaz was looking for something else other than God to, to find rescue, to find reprieve, and to alleviate his fears. Ahaz's heart was distant from God. He knew God's law, he knew his promises, but he did not believe or trust God. He didn't believe God would, would rescue them or protect them. The devotional reminds us, in the, in the devotional that we've been reading, reminds us this, where God sought to offer safety, Ahaz was ruled by idolatry, even to the point of sacrificing his own son, which he, we see in 2 Kings 16. See, if Ahaz doesn't obey God's instructions and repent, God made it clear that that would mean what that would mean for him and his people, destruction. Now think about this with me. God's relentless pursuit of Ahaz was not only for his repentance, him turning from his sin and turning to God, but for people's salvation. See, God and his promise to bring a Messiah wasn't just for Ahaz, but it was for the people that they would know and receive salvation. Well, what does that remind us of? Does that remind us of Jesus Christ himself? That God's relentless love for his people is seen in Jesus' life? His perfect life, he perfectly obeyed God? His death on the cross for your sins and my sins? His resurrection from the dead to defeat, defeat both sin and and, and death, his, his ascension as he now reigns in heaven as king and Lord ruling over us, and his even continual intercession for us as he presents us to our Father. God is relentless in making known to us the true hope that believers are to have, and that is in Jesus. You see, Ahart's heart was overwhelmed by the temporary 
and uncertain turmoil that he was experiencing. Yet God confronts him with an internal perspective. Even in Ahaz's waywardness, even in his contention and rejection of God's power and presence, Isaiah gives him a sign. What does it say? Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. This was to be his hope. This is our hope. A great salvation has arrived, and it's through the birth of Jesus. See, God is with us as we deal with the many uncertainties of this life. He's with us as we experience political turmoil, wars, injustices, death of loved ones, illnesses, broken relationships, divisions within families. Jesus has arrived to be with us, and he offers us eternal hope in our temporary afflictions. His relentless pursuit is seen in Christ's loving presence, his power, and his promises, and he asks us to trust him in our weaknesses, believing that he is very present with us and he will never leave us. After that phone call that I received in California, I met with Joyce for many years, and we tirelessly worked through the intruding feelings of rejection, of her insecurities, of her anxiety, and of her fears, of even wanting to take her own life. Each session, I reminded her again and again of the hope that she has in Jesus Christ to face her fears, to face her anxiety that she had over many relational issues. I reminded her each week of Christ's guaranteed, undeniable presence, his faithful and fulfilled promises, and his mighty and an enabling power that are hers in Jesus Christ. I continually pointed her to Jesus as her only hope. Yes, we talked about other things, but my primary goal was for her to see that she can have confidence to live this life no matter how hard it may be for her. And over the years, I saw glimpses of growth as she more and more began to see more clearly God's relentless love for her and Jesus. Her situation didn't change, but God, through his work of grace and love, changed her to deeply trust him in her dark times, clinging on to Jesus as her hope. As she realized, more importantly, that Jesus, her hope, was holding on and clinging to her. How about you? In a season where many of us are sensitive to the reality of doubt and fear, may Jesus' love relentlessly abound to you, my, my dear friends. May this truth be known and felt and experienced, that he is the rescue and ransom for us, promising that as a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. My dear brothers and sisters in Jesus, don't harden your heart like Ahaz as you experience turmoil of many kinds, but confidently, confidently trust and experience the, God, the presence of God with you, the promises of God over you, and the power that is in you. Let me remind you of how these prophecies had been fulfilled in Jesus. Turn with me to Luke chapter 2. We see that hope has arrived. Follow along as I read. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloth, laid him in a manger, because there is no room, no place for him in the end. And in the same region were the shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of, of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And I love this. Angel said to him, Fear not. Behold, I give you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. 
For unto, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And he will be a sign for you, and he will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he has pleased. Can you imagine hearing that even now today? How majestic that might have been for the shepherds. Then when the angels went about from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, it must have moved their hearts, right? <laughs> Let us go over to Bethlehem and see the thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, not slowly, haste. They were truly transformed, were they not? And they found Mary and Joseph and a baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they may know the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured, uh, treasured all of these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Prophecy has been fulfilled, my brothers and sisters in Christ. The promised Messiah has arrived and it is Jesus. He is the hope that the Old Testament were waiting for. He is our hope for today. You see, our hope is worth waiting for. I love this story later in the next section in Luke 2, chapter 22 to 32, about Simeon as he waited on the promised Messiah. Listen to how he waited. He says, when the time came for the purification according to the law of Moses, they brought up to Jerusalem to present himself to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who, who first opens the room shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was a righteous devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, meaning waiting for the promised Messiah. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And, he had been revealed, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when, his, when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, again, can you imagine the scene? Here he is. He's been promised that he would see the promised Messiah. Finally, it has happened, right? And he, he took him into his arms and he blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation so that you have prepared in, in the presence of all the peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and, to, and for glory to your people Israel. Imagine you were Simeon. Little, little is known about him historically. It seemed he was diligently waiting for the consolation. He was diligently waiting for the promised Messiah, the hope that God would come to rescue and confront, comfort his people to come into that temple. He was waiting for the promised Messiah day in, day out, year after year. Simeon was waiting and waiting, hoping and hoping that, that this would be the day that he would see the promised Messiah. In fact, the Holy Spirit promised him that he would see the Lord Messiah before he died. Now, I hate waiting for traffic. I hate waiting in lines, especially at Christmas time, right? I want, my, I want to pay for it now, right? And yet Simeon waited for years for this day to come. I wonder how he felt each day as he waited for his promise to be fulfilled. I bet he was hopeful. I bet he was excited. Okay, this is going to be the day. I can't wait. I'm going to go into the temple. He went in, not begrudgingly, I'm sure. He went in waiting, expecting that he would see the Messiah one day soon. I wonder if we're much like the little girl on Miracle on 34th Street, the Christmas movie, remember? It's about proving Santa is real. And this young girl was taught not to believe in Santa, and yet he was, he was confronted with this character that was Santa in the story. And she just didn't believe, and so she finally 
got to know this, this man who's called Santa, and she wanted to believe. And so she asked him for a big, a big thing, like a house, right? And so when Christmas came, finally the day came, she was disheartened. And she sat around the Christmas tree, and as they rode, drove even to the place where the Santa Claus will be delivering his promise, he, she said, I believe, I believe, I believe. Is there much hope in that? <laughs> I believe, I believe. No, but I bet, though, through the promise of the Holy Spirit revealed to Simeon, he said, I believe, I believe, I believe. So each day I'm going to go confidently thinking I'm going to meet the Savior. And I'm going to live my life accordingly because I'm one day I'm going to meet my Savior. I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe he persevered each and every day. And so the question that the devotion asks us, how did he persevere through the frustration that comes with knowing the end of the story, but having to live with uncertainty in, in between times? We get a sense from Simeon that he faithfully showed up at that temple expecting to meet the promised Messiah, for he really believed and thus pro trusted the promise of the Holy Spirit. Since Jesus' first coming up to today, we have seen him. The Holy Spirit has revealed him to us. We have faith in Jesus Christ. We have received his salvation, and yet we still live in a broken world. He promises that he will come again to bring us to our final destination, ending all the pain, ending all the sorrow, ending all the conflict, ending all the suffering, ending all the injustices, ending death itself that we still experience today. During the prayer visual, we were directed to read Isaiah 11. And there's a part in this section that reminds us of what he is going to bring. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 11, verses one and two, and verses six through nine. There shall, be, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jeff, Jesse, from the root of Jesse, and a branch from its root shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord, again, talking about the promised Messiah, shall rest upon him. And the spirit of wisdom and understanding, and the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And look, look, look what happens as he comes and as he comes again. It says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The shepherd shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. I love this one. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. And they shall not hurt or destroy. They shall not hurt or destroy in my holy mountain. Oh, may that one day come. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. One day, right? One day when Christ finally comes a second time, we will experience that reality. No more conflict, no more pain, no more competition, no one trying to get the other. We will dwell in peace with one another, and we have hope that that will be. That's what Titus, that's what Paul is getting at in Titus, that, that Christians can wait as Simeon waited says, for the grace of God has appeared, right? That's his first coming, bringing salvation for all kinds of people. And then in verse 13, it says, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There he's talking about the second coming. He says, for those who are waiting for a second coming, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all un unlawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. See, Paul reminds Titus that Jesus will be coming again so eagerly for us to eagerly await for this most blessed and glorious hope. The promised Messiah was the hope for the Old Testament believers, and the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ, is the hope for us today. So we eagerly, we eagerly believe and expect the return of Jesus Christ. And so we live our life as though that is going to happen, that each day we promise we're going to live by the grace of the gospel, we're going to live by, by the way that he would desire us to live. 
where we want to more and more renounce sin and to live a godly, in a godly Christ-centered way. We live because we know that one day he is coming to bring us home. Not to earn his salvation, not to, to think that, any, that us doing this thing is going to bring him any more love towards us. But no, we do that because we know that he has promised us that he will come and we want to live out of a grateful, grace-filled heart to live in a way that honors and glorifies him. The question for us then is to consider, do we eagerly await with the same confident hope of Simeon did for Jesus' first coming? Simeon was joyful. He was content to see how it unfolded from his very eyes, confident that God's promise will be fulfilled at the perfect time. And as the Apostle Paul reminds in 2 Timothy 4.8, for the good of all who have longed for his appearing. We now wait for our faithful eternal king to arrive a second time. May we wait confidently, expectantly, joyfully, for he will come again. You can bank on it. It is 100% guaranteed. So until Christ comes again, don't lose hope for this baby boy, baby born in Bethlehem, came to open the eyes of our blind eyes. He came to proclaim good news to the poor. We are the spiritual poor. And he will return to gather and give us what we need. And we look forward to that day, to our final destination. He will do it. This is what the table reminds us of, does it not? That yes, that we celebrate his giving of his life, his death, his body broken for us, his, his, his um, blood shed for us. We do this, right, to remind us of what is coming to, to us when he comes again. Where we will celebrate this banquet with him for all eternity, right? One day we will be with him face to face having a banquet meal. This reminds us that one day that's going to happen. We can experience his grace and mercy today as we remember that his body was broken for us and his blood was shed for us. So let us prepare our hearts and before we read the liturgy that's found in your bulletin, may you just maybe silently for a few moments seek the Lord of God's grace. Ask him to, to work in your heart. And if you're struggling with hope, ask him to help you to have that renewed hope again. If, you are, if you're doubting that hope, help him to remind of, mind you of the certainty of his hope. But we'll just spend some time just, just seeking the Lord, asking him to do his work that he needs to do in and through you. So let's, let us pray silently. Oh, Father, thank you for hearing our prayers. And Lord, now prepare us for this meal as we recite together this liturgy found in our bulletin or overhead. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy and merciful God, our Father, you have made us in your image and for yourself. You made this good world for us to tend to enjoy. God, our Father. You sought your ancient people when they strayed from you. You freed them from your oppressor and brought them home. God, our Father. Hear the grace of the grace you have sent your Son to bring us home to you by his incarnation, yes. by his death, yes. by his resurrection. Yes. By God, our Father. Hear the Holy and merciful God, our Father, send down your Holy Spirit on our bread and our cup, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, and on your people, that we may be the body of Christ, reconciled to you and to each other by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one with Christ. Until Christ shall come in final victory and we feast together in his heavenly banquet, we cry. Maranatha, even so, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.
on the night in which he was betrayed. He took bread and he said, this is my body given for you. That was hard and that was good because that, his death is, is, it should be hard, right? His death accomplishes great for us, right? His body given for us, do this in remembrance of me. Sorry for my ad libs today. <laughs> On that same night, he took the, the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Until that day, right, where we just acknowledge that we will have that eternal feast with him as elders and deacons come up to the prayer to serve. Again, let me pray over this time. Holy Spirit, continue to work your work of grace, giving us more and more hope in these days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. If our elders and deacons or our servant can come, in, and if the welcome team can begin to dismiss our people.
sisters, believe it, Jesus died for you so you can have forgiveness. Brothers and sisters in Christ, believe it, Christ's blood was shed for you. You are cleaned. Experience his freedom in Christ. Precious God, thank you for the gift of grace that we experienced throughout this service this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness to your promises. They are guaranteed to us that Christ has come and he's going to come again. And Lord, we look forward to that day and so help us to live confidently before you, expecting that day where you would come, Lord Jesus, living our lives before you the way that you have called us to live it. Give us grace. Help us encourage one another, but let us continue to hold on to the only hope that we really need, as that is you, Jesus Christ. Now let us pray this prayer together, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now respond to this grace by singing our last hymn. Now may the message of this Advent season, the message of hope, the message of love, the message of peace, the message of joy, may they fill you in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Go in Christ, serving Christ in this world in which we live. Go in peace.